So, following on from that, I've been asked to come and talk to you about falls and bone health. My name's Ruth Dobson. I'm one of the research fellows working with Professor Giovanoni at the Royal London Hospital. This is an area that I've become increasingly interested in over the past year or so, and this is really to try and raise everyone else's interest as well. So, falls and MS. Probably most of the people in this room can tell me a lot more about falls than I have personal experience of. They're a common symptom of MS, and they're one of the most troublesome. They can lead to significant injuries. When you actually go out and ask people with MS, do you fall over, there's a resounding yes as the answer. If, um, the National MS Society in America sent out a survey, asked people whether they had falls, and two-thirds of those people that they asked had had falls in the past six months. And of those, two-thirds of them had actually resulted in injury. Falls are often more common in people who have impairment with walking. But what I found the most startling finding from this survey was that only half of the people who have falls actually tell a health professional about them. As physicians, as clinicians, if we don't know about something, we can't do anything about it. We're not very good at asking people about falls, and we have to get better. But also, it's something that we really need to bring out into the open and talk about far more. Because there are ways that we can manage walking impairment and falls in MS. It's a multidisciplinary approach. We don't have any drugs, we don't have any magic fix it to get falls better. But what we do have is access to physiotherapy services that can both help to maintain a more normal gait and also improve abnormal gait. Often when you develop weakness or stiffness in the legs, then your gait, the way you walk, can change and this can actually put you at more risk of falls. So it's, we need to um, help people to learn how best to walk to avoid falling over. And there are specific interventions for certain symptoms that affect walking. However, the thing that we can do something about is fractures and bone health. If you fall over and break a bone, that's bad news. It takes a while, it can often interrupt your walking, takes a while to get better. Obviously, they're very painful and um, put you at risk of further complications. So if I'm talking about bone health, what do I mean by bone health? What I take it to mean is strong bones. I'm sure lots of people in the audience will have heard of osteoporosis, which is thinning of the bones. If bones become thin or weak, either with osteoporosis or just slightly thinner before osteoporosis develops, they can become more likely to fracture and break. There are certain fractures, like hip fractures, that are more likely to happen if you have thin bones than if you don't. What we worry about is the combination of somebody who has slightly thinner bones and who's at increased risk of falling, puts your fracture risk up an awful lot. So some of the work that I did looked at fracture risk in people with multiple sclerosis. There is data out there, there's not much, but there is some. And when you pool all of the available data that's around, people with MS have about a 30% increase in the risk of fractures. So you're 1.3 times as likely to have a fracture if you have MS than if you don't. And this is taking all people with MS, it's a very wide selection. What kind of fractures are you more likely to get if you have MS? The answer is pretty much anything. But what I found most startling was the fact that risk of hip fractures was far higher with MS, and also humerus. These fractures are associated with falling over. So it does seem that it's the combination of falls and slightly weak bones that puts people at risk of developing these fractures. So really important, what can we do to try and reduce this? Now that we're just getting this data through, can we reduce the risk of having a fracture? Well, first of all, to try and understand why people with MS seem to have thinner bones. There's a number of factors that have been shown to be associated with MS that are also associated with thin bones. We know that lack of vitamin D is very topical in MS, and this has also been associated with thin bones. We also know that um, people with MS are more likely to be female, and the risk of osteoporosis is higher in women, especially postmenopausally because of hormonal changes. And finally, smoking. Although certainly by no means everyone with MS smokes, there is an um, increased rate of smoking amongst people with MS, which can then contribute to weak bones. So there are some common factors. The other thing is, once you've got MS, it does associate it with things that increase the risk of poor bone health. So fatigue um, and poor mobility. If you're not weight-bearing, your bones can become weaker. So if you, um, and we know that MS can help stop people doing things. The other thing is steroid treatment. 
Steroids have been shown to weaken bones, and if people are getting repeated courses of steroids, this can put their bones at risk of becoming weaker. And as I said, the majority of fractures result from falls. So what can you do about this? It's, it sort of all sounds very depressing, but actually part of the point of this talk is to try and raise awareness, to try and change things so that this becomes less of a trend. Being, a, being aware of the importance of bone health is an important first step. If you don't know about something, you can't do anything to change it. And it's really something that it's important to raise awareness of amongst neurologists. We're trying to raise awareness at the Royal London Hospital and also trying to increase awareness around the country. This is something that's quite new. There are also online fracture risk calculators where you can actually go out and see what your own risk of having um, a fracture in the next 10 years is. They're available online and they consist of a number of questions which are easily answerable about yourself. And they come out with a picture like this, demonstrating, this is from some dummy data that I put in, but demonstrating what your chance of fracture is. And then you can report that to somebody and say, do I need any further tests? Do I need anything to try and reduce this risk of fracture? Knowledge is key, and once you've got the data, you might be able to um, raise it to do something about it. The problems are, we don't know how accurate the risks generated by the online tools are. They certainly don't include MS as a risk factor fracture, but they will give you a broad idea of what your fracture risk is likely to be, based on your age, on your gender, and on other factors. But they, what they can be used, and what um, NICE, who guides what investigations we do say, is that they should be used to test, to see whether you need further tests for thin bones, so whether there are any further tests that need to be done. There are also things that you can actually do to improve your bone health, regardless of as doctors or anything like that. Stopping smoking, every time you go to the doctor, if you smoke, you probably get told to stop smoking. It's important from a bone health point of view, if nothing else. It, making sure you eat a good and varied diet and moderate alcohol intake. I think, not saying stop drinking completely, but not drinking to excess. And again, moderate exercise. Exercise is good for your bones, regardless of what exercise you do, sort of keeping active. And then other tests, things like testing for thyroid function, which can be discussed with your doctor. The next thing is supplementation. And I know most of the people who we see in the clinic at the Royal London, we will check vitamin D levels. If you're being seen in other places, it is worth knowing what your vitamin D level is. Because if it's low, then it can be supplemented and increased. If you're vitamin D deficient, then you should have your vitamin D replaced. If you're taking high-dose vitamin D, there are some concerns about calcium, and this should only be done in conjunction with your doctor. In um, women of a certain age, then a, a discussion about hormone replacement therapies and the risks and benefits is a useful thing to have. And if you do have all the tests and are found to have low bone mineral density, then there are treatments available. I'm not going to go into details about them, but there are treatments out there that we can give that have been shown to improve bone mineral density and reduce the risk of fracture. So, in conclusion, what it says, even though the risk of fracture is increased, there are things that we can do about this. There are many things that we can do to mitigate it, right from improving exercise, improving awareness, through to formal treatments. The big issue is that actually at the moment the pr problem is under-recognised. If you don't recognise a problem, you can't do something about it. So please don't be afraid to bring up this topic with your neurologist. So I'd like to finish there and take any questions.